Hello, and welcome to the MS for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10, Bible-believing Christian. And on today's show, I want to address a particular topic that piggybacks off of my new book, Hard is Not the Same Thing as Bad. And it's actually the name of a chapter within the book. And the idea is I often get asked, okay, so if you think that all hard things are good, which I do not, so let's just kind of set that aside. But if you're kind of lobbying for this idea that we need to reframe our view of hard, that we need to view hard things not in the light of how do I get away from this as fast as possible or how do I avoid it altogether. So, you know, I'm, I'm hearing from lots of people that are saying, I understand that kids are a blessing, but I just really don't want any because I can objectively see that they would get in the way of my current lifestyle. And I really enjoy my life and I really like where I am right now. And so I think I'm just going to avoid kids altogether. And I, I think that's a podcast for another day from a biblical perspective, whether it is biblical, whether it is of the Lord to avoid kids altogether for the purpose of avoiding something that would kind of cramp your lifestyle or change how you live or complicate things or insert whatever phrase that I've heard. And someone's going to say, nobody thinks that way, Abby. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. I have been contacted by many people who either are addressing this conundrum with their spouse, or they're struggling with this internally themselves, or they're a single woman that's afraid to get married because the prospect of kids makes them worry that they will lose themselves and they will lose all of the fun and the joy and the spontaneity in their lives. I see it in comment sections. So that's kind of another podcast for another day. But that would be a good example of the attitude that I think we see too much of in our society, which says if it's going to complicate things, if it's going to take the hard to the next level, I'll just take a pass on that, please, Lord. Um, and we don't find a lot of biblical support for that. And we don't find a lot of support for that when we examine the lives of faithful Christians like Corey Ten Boom and Jim Elliott and C.S. Lewis and... Eric Little and uh, Gladys Aylward and George Mueller, and I could go on and on. If In case you're wondering, a great resource for both adults and kids is the Christian Heroes Then and Now series. They're so engaging, they're so well-written and so informative, and yet they are historically based on the lives of these people who have absolutely chosen to do hard but good things for the Lord. So the idea that I want to express today as someone who's known for trying to reframe a sprint away from hard into a lean into it when it's clearly what the Lord has called us to, for the purpose of seeing what good he has for us and also bringing him glory in our response, I want to look at the idea of the kinds of things that are potentially hard and bad or are potentially hard and not the same thing as good, even though we can tend sometimes to attribute a level of righteousness or holiness or elevated enlightenment, even in a Christian sense, to those who lean into all the hearts, who are always ready for a challenge, who are always doing it the most difficult way. And we can think about this in terms of an athletic approach. So if you think about the modifications within an athletic move or an exercise move. So if I do a deadlift, for example, or a bicep curl or an overhead press or a squat, I can start with body weight and I can just do the move without any extra resistance. And then I can maybe add a band, which doesn't usually add quite as much resistance depending on the thickness of the band as adding dumbbells or a bar of weight. And then I could move on to dumbbells or I could put two plates on the end of a bar and I could up my weight or I could add a dynamic thrust and make it an isometric movement or I could, um, you know, add a one-legged component to a squat or I could then turn it into a pistol squat, which is a one-legged component and you squat all the way down with one leg extended and one leg doing the squat and then stand all the way back up. And then I can make it a pistol squat with a box jump. And so if you see all these progressions of the difficulty of the move, if you have a person who has the capability of doing the hardest version every single time, and that's the one that they choose, even when they're injured, 
even when they're having the kind of day where their body is screaming at them to rest and they just ignore it, even when they haven't eaten enough that morning to fuel their bodies and they haven't drunk enough water not to be dehydrated, even when they're coming in emotionally depleted and our bodies are holistic beings. We have a mind, body, soul, emotion, spirit, elemental aspect to our body that when all mixed together, every aspect is going to affect another aspect. So I know that when I learned very, very shocking and hard, hard, devastating, grief-filled news five minutes before I had to teach a body pump class. And I could have said, you know, sorry guys, I've just had a personal tragedy and I cannot teach this class. Um, honestly, I went into autopilot and it didn't even occur to me to say that, but I taught the class mentally checked out, going through the motions robotically, trying not to cry in the middle of teaching squats. I made it through the class because my body knew the move so well that it could compensate, but absolutely that emotional aspect was affecting my physical performance. So if you've got a person who is capable physically of doing the pistol box jump squat, and they think that the best version of exercising is to do the pistol box jump squat every single time. They don't take rest days. They never take the lower options. I think you've got a person, and I can tend toward this, I cannot do a pistol box jump squat. Let me just clarify that. But I can tend to be the person that wants to do the hardest version of everything because otherwise it feels like I'm quote unquote slacking. Okay. So, and I'm a fitness instructor and I've been a fitness instructor for 16, 17 years, something like that. And so when you're talking about from the physical perspective, what it does to you to constantly choose the most extreme version of difficulty and challenge, it doesn't necessarily make you a well-rounded person. It tends to make you a very intense person. It tends to make you a hyper-focused person. It tends to make you goal-oriented to the exclusion of personal relationships. And, and th that's not really where my personality goes. I just gave the example of kind of leaning into, ooh, if I, could, if I could take it up a notch, let's do that. And the Lord has had to teach me through a variety of things, including some injury and some slowing down as I've had babies and as my body has gotten older, that the most intense, high octane, difficult, hard on your body version is not always the best. And I think we can take that example and extrapolate it pretty faithfully into other areas of our lives. So when people immediately assume that I think all hard things are good, I, I of course want to correct that misconception. And I want to say, of course, not all hard things are good. If we think about cancer, cancer is hard, but cancer is not good. Cancer is a component of this fallen, sick world that we live in that has disease in it as a result of the fall. And we won't be healed of all of those diseases until we have a new body and a new earth and we are united with Christ. But there are aspects of cancer that can still have a good effect on our character. We probably have all heard that verse at some point or another from Romans 5, 3 through 5, that says that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so yes, cancer can have some good effects on us, even though cancer itself is very bad. Um, if you are reading, hard is not the same thing as bad. You're going to eventually come to some chapters where I talk about some very hard and in many ways bad aspects of my relationship with my father. And it was hard for me to write those chapters. And it was sanctifying for me to write those chapters. And it was a lot of work and a lot of prayer and a lot of just mental gymnastics to make sure that I got it right. And a lot of back and forth with my parents as I, as I submitted those chapters to them to edit and to give me feedback. And I'm grateful for their feedback and I'm happy with how the chapters turned out. But 
I would not tell someone who has a struggle with a loved one that that struggle in and of itself is good. I would not wish that on anyone. I would not say, hey, I've been through this and therefore, you know, you would be fine if you went through it. Of course, our situations are going to be exactly the same and your response is going to be exactly the same. We can all just grit our teeth through it. It's going to be great. However, I talk in those chapters about the fact that the Lord has given me so much more empathy, so much more experiential just kindness that I feel towards people who struggle with family relationships, who struggle with hard relationships that I wouldn't have had if I didn't have the situation of a hard family relationship in my own life. And the same is true of some friendships that I've gone through and friendship breakups. And it's not anything you would wish on anyone. You're not saying that it's good in the sense that you're saying that this banana bread is good or that this marriage is good when it's a really good marriage or that, you know, this hug from your child is so good and it's so life-giving and it's so pure and lovely. No, you're not comparing cancer and hard, broken relationships that the Lord has to mend and abuse and mental illness and other forms of sickness or job loss. We're not going to be trite and say, oh, those are just good things because they produce character. However, the Lord can use them for good. So the question that I get asked is, all right, so the Lord can use some things for good. And actually, I'm going to say the Lord can use all things for good because the Bible literally tells us that he works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if you are in Christ, if you love Christ, if you are called according to his purpose, then he is working all those things together for your good and for his glory. But I do think there are times, and I have a chapter on this as well, when we shoot ourselves in the foot, when we choose things that are unnecessarily difficult, unnecessarily complicated, unnecessarily painful, either out of pride, because we're trying to prove ourselves with those box jump pistol squats, right? Or out of a sense of misplaced martyrdom or masochism. So I'm going to give you an example that I didn't give you in the book because this example didn't exist yet. And I do give you some specific examples of choices that I've made in my life that have caused me a lot of grief where the Lord was clearly offering me a better, yes, easier, less complicated, but better and better, not but better and better way out of this situation. And I chose to grit my teeth and lean into the one that made me feel like I was, I don't know, accomplishing more, stronger, Um, more capable, which is honestly a lie from Satan. We are not capable without Christ. And if we are veering off the path that he has given us, that sometimes is a path that is strewn with, you know, this isn't always the case, but rose petals and easy situations. And there are joyful things in life that just come easily. And you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you have that third baby and you have just been bracing because babies number one and two had super hard stages and you love them to death and you wouldn't trade them for anything. But those super hard stages have just really refined you and you're grateful for the refining, but you were just kind of bracing yourself for baby number three and baby number three sleeps through the night after three months and just gurgles and coos and is the easiest going little bundle of squishy love. And it's not that you love them more than your other two children at all, but you can say, wow, Lord, thankful for this, thankful for the unexpected grace of a quote unquote easy baby. So when we're veering off of those obviously God-given paths and instead we are tromping through weeds and briars and thorns that the Lord never intended us to to tromp through. (laughs) Don't you love that Texas word, tromp? Um, We're not following his will. Can I just say that? Like, We are not more righteous and choosing a better way when we intentionally veer off of God's plan for our lives into challenges for the sake of challenges. Let me put it that way. So the example that I want to give you is one that if you're on my newsletter, and if you're not, you should be, because once a week on Saturday evenings, I send out a meal plan with five breakfast and five dinner links and descriptions and a graphic you can print if you want to or save to your phone to remind you of what you're making that night, recipes, all the things. And then I give you a little life update at the beginning. It's not very long. It's just once a week in your inbox. So I'll put a link in the show notes for you to subscribe if you have not done that already. 
And I think you will find a lot of value in that and a little bit of entertainment each week. But if you're following along on my newsletter, then you already know this. And I mentioned it on social media at the beginning of the week as well. But we had decided to stay put in our home after it flooded three weeks ago to today. Um, We had decided to stay in our home and do the home renovations ourselves to try to recoup some of the costs of our deductible. And it certainly wasn't absolute chaos, but it also wasn't minimal chaos. (laughs) There is sheetrock dust on everything, our shoes, our clothes. Anytime I wear my black workout clothes, I have like little white handprints all over them. Um, And yes, we're sweeping Yes, we're mopping. Yes, we're vacuuming. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, There's definitely not enough storage in the downstairs when we took out all the kitchen cabinets for just kind of our basic stuff. Most of our basic stuff is packed. So we feel like we're kind of constantly looking for something that we need. And there's not a really perfect spot for it. So it keeps migrating, which if you've ever, you know, tried to find your scissors or that bowl that you need for your salad or whatever, you know, just any of those situations, they're hardly life altering, but they're frustrating, right? They, they complicate things more. You spend a lot more brain space trying to find stuff. Homeschooling has also been a little more complicated as our space has shrunk to this kitchen table and it's the table that we use for food prep and homeschooling and all the things. No big deal. It's great. I'm grateful for the table. It's just a lot of people at not a lot of space, if that makes sense. Um, Things are moved around. We didn't have a sink for a couple of weeks. Thankfully, Sean kind of jerry-rigged our sink back up, which being able to wash my hands in my sink again, instead of walking to a bathroom or going upstairs, being able to wash dishes, praise the Lord, feels like such a gift once you haven't had it for a couple of weeks. And I know many of you have gone for much longer than that without your sinks active and your stoves working and you cooked over camper stoves and griddles. And I mean, you're the will MVPs, honestly. But if you've been through flooding and I got so many comments and DMS when I talked about the flood that I was kind of shocked about how many people have been through flooding. It is not an uncommon experience. In fact, some of you that live in States like Louisiana or live in areas like Houston, Texas that are hit by hurricanes a lot have experienced four or five ripped out kitchens and it just boggles my mind or bathrooms or whole second floors that were ruined that y'all have persevered through this. Um, I'm so impressed because I think I might give up and move because we've only done this one time and, uh, and we still haven't even gotten to the renovation process and it's a lot, you know? So we had decided to kind of muscle through in the Lord's strength, but this is where he clearly had us because at the beginning of all of this, the insurance company had said that they were willing to pay for a house for us to live in while the renovations were done. I think they were assuming that a renovation company would do them. We've talked to them. They're fine with our doing it ourselves. However, no such house existed. And we looked ourselves for Airbnbs, for rental houses. I mean, It's kind of hard when you're looking at rental houses because most of them are not furnished and we needed places to do school and places to sit and, you know, stoves to use and all of that. Now, some of them have appliances, but not necessarily anywhere to sit. And we were thinking we probably wouldn't move all of our furniture somewhere temporarily. It was just kind of a lot of factors. And what it kept coming down to over and over again was either that if we did manage to find a place that had enough beds, assuming that we were sharing, this was not like everybody needs his or her own bed or anything like that happy to share just enough beds for us to share and be all there. If we did find a place like that, a lot of times it was 45 minutes away from our current house where we would be doing the work or from our church or from Sean's office or from my gym that I teach at really wouldn't make a lot of sense to drive 45 minutes to teach an hour long class and then drive 45 minutes home. So the conclusion kept being over and over again, it makes way more sense because we can sleep in our own beds, have our own clothes and obviously make do in our own downstairs that we just stay here. Now I will tell you that the Lord has been really gracious to guard my heart and my mind through this process in the midst of some of the more challenging aspects of it to not feel completely overwhelmed. And I'm telling you that's of him. That's his peace that passes all understanding. And I'm so grateful for it. But there were definitely a couple of days during book launch week, which was last week, which was an amazing success. Praise God. 
and thank you guys so much for your support, um, that the mess was just starting to get to me. And it wasn't even, we hadn't cleaned the mess. We had cleaned the mess and it was still getting to me because it was still so visually chaotic to not be able to close cabinet doors and things like that. And again, this is a first world problem. There are people that deal with way worse than this in despair over our circumstances. And I, and I didn't feel in despair. I could just feel that my shoulders were never relaxing and that they were starting to creep up. I'm not trying to elevate this to any kind of high standing of suffering or, or any kind of true difficulty compared to many. But again, I talk in my book about the fact that we don't all have to have the same ticket to the same struggle bus to feel d downhearted between all the things I had going on with launch week, plus homeschooling, plus teaching classes, plus some other things I had on my plate with work, plus feeling like nothing ever really looked like it got back to normal and it was hard to find stuff, that it was, it was starting to wear on me a little bit, starting to wear a little bit thin. And I remember talking to my mom, oh, maybe on a Thursday, um, of last week and just saying, kind of laughing about the fact that we had just cleaned. We had just picked up together. We had just put babies down for naps and it's, it's still nothing, nothing looked in order. And she said, yeah, it's just going to be something that you are dealing with for a while for these next several months. I said, yeah, I know. And I, I think I've mentally prepared myself, but, um, sometimes, sometimes I feel it's starting to, you know, twitch a little bit. She's like, I get it. I get it. And then, if not that night, the very next night, but I think it might have been that night, Sean heard from the, if it wasn't at night, it might have been during the day, but I think it was that day, Sean heard from the rental company. And they told us that they had found a property for our family. And I remember looking at Sean and saying, why, why are they looking? We told them we were staying here. He goes, I know. I told them not to look anymore. Um, I told them we were fine and that we would prefer to be here as opposed to any of the other options. So we both looked at each other kind of skeptically and shrugged and said, it's probably not going to be anything we can use anyway. Um, because of the options that we had seen before and they really weren't, they weren't, not only were they not ideal, they were, um, going to be more stressful than where we currently are. So we had, you know, obviously on balance decided to stay. And he said, we should probably look at it anyway. So they sent some pictures and the pictures looked great. It looked like it was a little bit hard to tell what was going on because it was an Airbnb, but there was a pool, which was sort of exciting and sort of scary. We have two almost three-year-olds. They can't swim yet. The pool didn't have a gate around it. So our first response was kind of cautious excitement. Um, and it looked like there was probably enough room for all of us. And it also had the added bonus of some room to run around. So one other option that we had found that had enough bedrooms for us was right on a busy city street. And when we're out on acreage, you know, taking two, three year olds to a busy city street area, that scares me even more than the pool. Um, because yes, we stay on high alert. Yes, we follow them around. Yes, we're constantly checking where they are. But if you got to stirring a pot for even a minute or two and they ran out the front door, man, you'd be in trouble. So that was not an option. So this place had some land to run around on, not a lot, but it was plenty of space for kids. So it was looking promising. And I remember we were looking at each other like, wait, could this, it was Thursday. It was Thursday because I had a book signing that night and he said, well, we can check it out on the way home from the book signing. So we're on the way home. We stop by, we have the key, the ladies being very communicative, the Airbnb owner, very communicative and helpful. And they're going to install a pool alarm and just some other things that helped kind of set our minds a little more at ease. And we do this walkthrough of this property and guys, I just had this overwhelming moment of Lord, you are so kind and we can do nothing to deserve this. We deserve none of this, right? We deserve separation from God. And yet he grants us his presence as we believe in him. Um, we deserve eternal punishment. And yet for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, would not have that eternal punishment, but would instead have eternal life with Christ. So I am fully cognizant as we're walking through this house that does have enough beds for us. That is a really nice house um, that has a pool 
that has areas for our kids to run around that has this giant tree in the front yard with like a swing underneath it. It's just these leafy branches spreading out. And I don't even know how old this tree is, but it was just gorgeous, gorgeous. And thinking, Lord, I know we haven't done anything to deserve this because we can't. I know this is not some sort of pat on the head or consolation prize for our house flooding, but whoa, what undeserved mercy to offer this to us. And we were still talking it through, but more and more, the impression was growing that this was absolutely of the Lord and that we had done nothing to find it. We had told them to stop searching for it. Sean had even made sure that the insurance agency, like, are you sure that you want to pay for this when we have a house that we're doing okay in? And the insurance agent said, it's already booked. It's yours. Um, which who does that? What insurance agent does that? Again, very much so of the Lord. So Sean and I went and got on that swing that was under that giant leafy, beautiful tree and just praised the Lord for his goodness and talked about kind of the logistical things of what it would look like to move our family there for several months while we do the renovations here. And I haven't even told you the best part. So it would be great if all of those things were true and the house were 30 or 45 minutes away, honestly, because the property is beautiful. But this house is only nine to 10 minutes from our current house. And the fact that we can easily take a backpack of clothes there and yet come back here and get more things that we need. And the fact that Sean can commute back and forth easily and work on the house and use his computer in his office and just move back and forth quickly. It's just mind bogglingly kind of the Lord. Now here's where I get to the part that demonstrates why this is an example of hard is not the same thing as good. There was a part in my brain that said, we shouldn't do this because it's not as difficult as our current circumstances. It's too easy. Now, this is not good theology, guys. The Bible doesn't call us to do the absolute worst, hardest, most difficult version so that we can be holier. Instead, it says things like, taste and see that the Lord is good and every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no changing or shifting shadow. Now we do know that we are called to take up our cross daily and follow Christ. We do know that those who put themselves first shall be last and the last shall be first. We do know that there are very countercultural concepts within Christianity that don't make a lot of sense for those who don't follow Christ. But this not only made sense, but it blew our minds with generosity. And I recognized that there was a pridefulness and a stinginess and a view of God that was not completely accurate to his character in my kind of clenching my hands around this harder situation at our ripped up home and saying, okay, but, but wouldn't I be tougher if I stayed here? I don't think I had that absolute fully formed thought in my mind. I don't think I actually thought anything like, wouldn't I be tougher if I stayed here? But wouldn't it be more of a testimony to hard is not the same thing as bad if I stayed here? Wouldn't it be, you know, proof of the Lord's growing character in us? Well, sure, if that's where the Lord has us. But if he so clearly has provided this good gift of rest, because I'll be honest, starting at the beginning of this week through the end of October, our family has quite possibly the busiest season that we have faced in a very, very long time, if ever. And I am confident that the Lord will get us through day by day. I am confident that he will teach us good things about how to continue to care for each other and be a blessing to each other and others. But being able to do that really busy season in a place that has floors we can sweep and they stay clean for a minute or two in a place where we have cabinets where we can put things away, in a place where we have functioning appliances, in a place where we have functioning sinks. It's just such a gift. I just keep saying that it's such a gift and it is a good thing. It's not as hard as the other thing, but it's still good. So I wanted to address that concept that yes, I believe some hard things are just bad. I still think that the Lord can use them for good in our lives, but I wouldn't ever call them inherently good things. And no, I don't believe that all easy things are inherently bad. 
because there are some things that are just the softest place to fall that are absolutely of God. And I really believe that this situation that he's put us in at the moment, giving us this soft place to land at this house while we do the hard work of these renovations and while we do the hard work of raising a family and while we do the hard work of homeschooling and while we do the hard work of speaking engagements and book launches and some traveling and all the other things in the mix is of him and I will praise him for it. And I encourage you to be on the lookout as well for opportunities to say, Lord, you call me to hard things all of the time and I thank you for that, but you gift me with good things and easy things sometimes and they can be the same thing as well. And I thank you for those too. If you enjoy the MS for Mama podcast, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and follow along, maybe share with friends or even leave a review. And if you want more content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, be sure to follow along on Instagram at m.is.or.mama.